The budget was yesterday and as expected. In fact, there have been very few budgets where the middle class has been happy. Budget is part of an overall vision. These are quite crazy figures. Every budget, and I'm not talking about this government, I'm talking about any government, most budgets, the threshold is continues to rise. Every year, the revenue foregone. You want more on education or healthcare? Shall we reduce defense or shall we reduce subsidies? This entire mystique about the budget on the tax side will go. You said you are concerned, not worried. I am actually worried. I'm sorry to say your question makes no sense to me. Namaste. Welcome to the Rising India podcast. I am Gautam Chikarmane, Vice President at Observer Research Foundation. And our guest today is Dr. Bibek Debroy. Dr. Debroy is the chairperson of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. As he's an economist, he has written at last count, uh, when I counted in 2021, he had written 114 books. Since then, I'm sure the number has crossed 120. The joke doing the rounds is that Vivek writes a book faster than what many people write a paper. Other than being an economist, he is also a, a master translator of Indian Sanskrit works. He has translated the Mahabharat, the Ramayana, and is currently translating the Puranas. He is one person who is able to work both in the past, in the region of our culture, and in the present of the economy. Welcome, Dr. Debroy. Thank you. Namaste. It's always a pleasure to have a chat with you, particularly under the ORF banner. Thank you. Welcome. So let me just jump straight into the deep end. Uh, the budget was yesterday and as expected. In fact, there have been very few budgets where the middle class has been happy and where taxpayers have been happy. And uh, as in the past, what we are seeing today is a taxpayer's angst that we are being increasingly squeezed and not getting the return on our taxes, so to say. We expected this to happen. We expected that to happen. I understand people not wanting to pay taxes or the fact that uh, taxes hurt. But is there some sort of an extra angst in India against paying taxes? For instance, if we just look at data, just 1.5% of the people pay income tax in India. To take that data even forward, today, income tax, personal income tax is now greater than corporate income tax. So, are we in, where are we headed with this? You're raising several issues. Firstly, a budget is not something that should be looked at in isolation. Budget is part of an overall vision. It is the first statement of intent because it's more than just an annual statement of the union government's receipts and expenditure, which is what a budget is. It's a statement of intent about what Modi 3.0 intends to do. It, is, it builds on the interim budget. It builds on Modi 1.0, Modi 2.0. And it looks forwards towards a developed India in 2047. Now, so far as the taxpayer angst is concerned, it is not something that is peculiar to India. It exists in every country. There is a distinction in law that's drawn between a tax and a fee. A fee is somewhere, something where the quid pro quo is obvious that I pay you this in return for this service. A tax is completely unlike that because a tax goes into the Consolidated Fund of India and the government through parliament decides what that money should be spent on. And sometimes the money leads to benefits that are not immediately visible. For example, a tax cut is immediate, it's visible. Unlike the building of infrastructure, the benefits are longer term. So obviously an economist 
obviously a finance minister will look at the productive potential of the economy in the longer run and it is a fact that capital investments yield greater multiplier benefits than revenue expenditure or tax cuts. So far as taxes are concerned, if it is indirect taxes, there is a template that is driven by GST and driven by the GST council, which is why changes in indirect taxes, unlike in the past, are not really part of the budget, except import duties, which is a different thing. So far as personal income taxes are concerned, and by the way, the distinction between personal income taxes and corporate taxes is a bit of a silo, because do realize all unincorporated enterprise pays personal income taxes. So eventually, that silo needs to go. Eventually, all the exemptions need to go. We already have two windows, which the finance minister mentioned in a budget speech. And one of the things that she has said very clearly is in the next six months, we will have a review of the Income Tax Act. That is correct. Which I presume will mean further simplification and removal of the present exemptions system. The reason you, you mentioned the percentage of Indians who pay income taxes. Now, there's a difference between the percentage, between the number who submit income tax returns and those who actually pay taxes. The, the number of people who actually pay taxes is much lower. This is not because of tax evasion. It is because of tax avoidance, availing of the exemptions. Plus, of course, there is the matter of the rural sector because agricultural income is under the purview of state governments. Okay, so let me uh, throw some more data. Over the past 10 years, personal income tax has grown at a compounded rate of more than 15%, 15.1%. Budget size has grown by 11.8%, CAGR. These are quite crazy figures in the sense the economy, they are growing much faster than the economy and partly that is understandable due to cleanup, due to GST, more people in the system and so on and so forth. But personal income tax, including, let us say, the unincorporated people that you mentioned, uh, growing at 15%, that's faster than the sensex. And on the other side, the utilization, we don't see it visible. You look at, other than roads, most of our infrastructure does not befit this kind of burden on the uh, on 1.5% uh, of the people paying individual income tax. And I'm just pulling them out. I I'm still on the angst story right now. And the entire discussion, you remember in the early 90s, after the 1991 budget, 98, 2000, early 2000s, you remember there was this whole discussion in the policy making circles about uh, widening the tax base, uh, about getting more people into the tax net. And rightly so. Somehow I feel that debate has ended. We are no longer thinking of those ideas. And to just illustrate one aspect is that every budget, and I'm not talking about this government, I'm talking about any government, most budgets the threshold is continues to rise. So it's that same group of people upon whom all these tax exercises are done and they are going further and further away. And this entire discussion about widening the tax base on the direct income tax side only, I, I know GST has widened the tax base already, has somehow diminished. What's going on? I don't think so. But on the angst part, since you said you're going to throw data at me, let me throw some data back at you. Today, if we take all taxes, union government, state government, direct, indirect, we pay as citizens 15% of GDP as taxes. In fact, a little lower. The benchmark amongst comparable countries is around 20%. Every year, the revenue foregone, 
because of exemptions and concessions is of the order of 5 and a 5 and a half percent of GDP. If we pay 15 percent, let's talk about some back of the envelope figures. Angst is reflected in expectations. We expect government to spend 6% of GDP on education. We expect government to spend 4% of GDP on health. 6 plus 4 is 10%. We expect government to spend 10% of GDP on infrastructure because China spends much more. 10 plus 10 is 20%. We expect government to spend 3% on defense. 20 plus 3 is 23%. We are already at 23%. And we haven't and talked we are about interest 15. and subsidies yet. Yes, and we are just paying 15%. So either we have to pay more and forego the exemptions, or alternatively, we have to accept that we are a relatively poor country we will not have airports like X country in the world. We will not have railway stations like Y country in the world. You cannot have it both ways. Now, so far as the angst is concerned, the angst is primarily amongst those who are salaried, who are roughly half the personal income tax payers. The remainder a veil of exemptions. There are limited exemptions that salaried people can avail of. So I come back to the same issue of exemptions. Today, since we are talking about direct taxes, GST, by the way, I'm glad you mentioned it, because enforcement has been better. And that's been one of the primary reasons why GST has brought more people into the net. So far as the personal income tax part of it is concerned, and when I say personal, I mean direct taxes, so both personal and corporate, there are more people in the net, but they're not necessarily paying taxes because of the exemptions. Today, there are two channels, and the finance minister in a budget speech said that a little less than two-thirds of corporate income taxpayers have availed of the, not zero exemption, but fewer exemption system, let's call it the new system. And all, a little more than two-thirds of personal income taxpayers have availed of the um, less exemption system. The, the, the new system. The, the new system. system. The way to go is the new system. And I repeat, it is not up to the union government to decide. It is up to the state governments. But sooner or later, as a country, we should decide that we will have to tax farm income, which does not mean that every poor farmer will have to be taxed because not. like everything else, it will be above a threshold. Be a slab system and the very rich farmers can be taxed higher. Uh, so that debate, I think, is out of, the, out of any discussion today of any policy circle because nobody wants to lose an election. I think we will end up uh, in 2047, Vikasit Bharat, with the rich farmers still not paying their share of taxes. Uh, no, but, but, let, I, let me, but let me interrupt you for a minute. Yeah. If you go back in history yeah. to, let us say, the 1950s and even earlier, farmers were taxed. Well, we didn't have reservations then. We didn't, we didn't have many things. And I think now the, the texture of the politics has changed uh, from what we are seeing. Uh, perhaps we are too close to it and maybe we are unable to uh, glide up to 35,000 feet as far as this kind of politics goes. But I'm not very confident about either taxing farmers is the last part. I'm not even confident about reforms, agricultural reforms, and we'll come to them in some time. One thing you mentioned uh, that we pay, we want 6% for uh, education, 5% for health, 10% for infra, 6% uh, for defense and so on. Now, let's leave defense aside. All others, I think uh, this whole manner of viewing outcomes of education, health care, um, particularly education and health care, on the basis of how much, what percentage of GDP is allocated to it, seems to be in dissonance 
into my mind uh, with causalities and outcomes. Just because you throw money uh, into a sector doesn't mean outcomes will be better. Or just because outcomes are bad, you throw money and you expect those. That I think that kind of policy making is probably behind us. I would like you to educate us on that. And to just give you a small example, if you look at Ministry of External Affairs, it's a very marginal, it used to be 18,000, 19,000, it's now 22,500 crore, a very marginal increase. But over the past five, I'm talking about the past five years. But look at the manner in which the ministry has been able to uh, punch way above its weight. So I think the outcomes today are no longer so badly dependent on financing as much as other related issues standing up, for instance, in the case of external affairs, or using technology to make, uh, to deliver outcomes and so on. I think we are probably still living in the past. How do you see this? I largely agree with some qualifications. <clears throat> One of the things as citizens, and you mentioned the angst, we refuse to accept is that resources have opportunity costs. Whatever I spend on something, I cannot spend on something else. I do actually think that given rising India, we need to spend much more on what you broadly said is MEA. But to come back to the point, when you're saying, you're saying two things actually. The first thing you're saying, that particularly for the social sectors, causality is not very easy to pin down and quantify. And for s to some extent, whether health leads to benefits or not is beside the point to some extent because it's an end in itself. Ditto for education. The girl child needs to be educated regardless of whatever the positive externalities from that are. If I look at both health and education, it is a fact that indicators have improved for both across the country. But there's a broader point, and the broader point is that there is a seventh schedule to the constitution. Under the seventh schedule to the constitution, some items are in the union list, some are in the concurrent list, some are in the state list. For example, school education is largely a state subject. Largely. Health is completely a state subject, regardless of the fact that there are central government schemes on health. If you are making the point that efficiency of public expenditure is important. If you are making the point that some of public expenditure is inefficient, these are all valid assertions. For example, the expenditure on education may be in the form of giving more increments to government school teachers who do not deliver or do not teach. Point taken. But it's also true that largely thanks to technology, Efficiency of public expenditures improved. Look, for instance, at the elimination of false beneficiaries, elimination of leakages, direct benefit transfers. I am not saying that everything is perfect. What I am saying is I accept your point, but this is not a binary. It's not as if we have reached the terminal goal of everything being perfect. But to deny that there have been improvements would not be correct. I'm not denying at all. I'm merely questioning this entire... Okay, let's move from individual taxpayer angst to political angst. This entire political angst about government has not looked at this sector because X percentage, it used to be X percentage, now it is X minus 0.1 percentage. While actually on the ground, you may not need that X plus or Y percentage. You may not need it. And somehow, the, the entire evaluation mechanism seems to be, how much are you spending on it? I, I get asked the same question and I reply exactly what you have said. That you want more on education or healthcare? Shall we reduce defense or shall we reduce subsidies? Shall we reduce, uh, fr take it from education or shall we stop infrastructure? So these, these choices are all there and I'm fully in, I'm just looking at the manner in which 
not just uh, politics, but even political economists are using this very loosely, as though it's some form of, a, of an axiom, uh, uh, of a political economy theorem, that uh, x, if you reduce the percentage from x to x minus 1, you are not giving adequate, you're not, you're not concerned about that particular sector. I, do you think, uh, I mean, am I wrong in thinking like this? Or uh, do, do economists need to change the way they look at these numbers? You are asking this question. In fact, this entire discussion has partly been triggered by the budget, which has happened. That's right. You are making a point that I think is worth elaborating on which is that if you are looking at 2047, the entire system of media, commentators, politicians, everyone, has not adjusted to what a budget ought to be. Now, what do I mean by that? A budget is about receipts and expenditure. Reform is work in progress. But as a terminal goal, when we have reformed the direct tax system, there will be no changes in taxes year to year. If one has reformed the indirect tax system and simplified GST and all goods and services come under GST, there will be no mystery about taxes. So this entire mystique about the budget on the tax side will go. Because it is not as if Narayanda Tiwari Sindhur budget year to year, things will change. Things will be stable. I might as well announce the budget in advance. The mystery and the hype centered around the budget will go as a terminal goal. I am not saying we have reached there. Similarly, for expenditure, as a country, and the reason I am saying as a country is public expenditure is not merely that borne by the union government, it's also that borne by the state government. It's also, by the way, something that we forget, borne by local governments. We pay a lot of attention to the Union Finance Commission, we don't pay enough attention to the state finance commissions and the devolution of funds and various other things to local bodies. Fundamentally, given the opportunity cost, what we are talking about is a national consensus on what are public goods and what government in all of its three levels, union government, state government and local government should be spending on. Once we have that consensus, then expenditure also does not change from year to year. Hence, the budget becomes an open book kind of exercise. We will head towards that. The point you are making and I am endorsing it using slightly different language is that most of us have not accepted the fact that the budget, once these reforms are there, it's the direction of the reforms are clear on taxes, not yet on expenditure. Once that happens, budget is a transparent process. I think you are right, uh, Dr. Debroy, uh, because I have also been thinking this thing about adjustment. For instance, at a dollar adjusted, inflation adjusted, no, not adjusted for inflation, just pure GDP growth, India is likely to add about $400 billion this year. Now, $400 billion is 1.5 times the entire Indian economy of 1991. It is equal to the Indian economy of 1996, $392 billion or, or, or so. And I don't think we... Uh, the, the community that looks at policy making closely has adjusted to this fact. I mean, in, in, in a manner of speaking, every year, this year we will add a Denmark to our GDP, the equivalent of Denmark's economy. Two years later, we will add an equivalent of Qatar and so on. The, 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 I mean, these are just random numbers. But the scale from where we began, people like us who are children of liberalization uh, and have seen the, as children, we have seen the before and as professionals, the after of what liberalization did for us in 1991. Are, uh, I mean, we are the, clearly there is a benefit, benefit going on, but 
the policy making, uh, the policy debates, the policy commentariat remains, in my opinion, and from what I'm seeing, is the same. We heard the same uh, questions in 1991, we heard it in 2007, we heard it in 2009, 10, 14, and till 2024. I think that's a good point. Let me shift the discussion. This budget now talks about jobs in a very big way. Okay? And kudos to the government. I think it's also an acceptance of the fact that the uh, jobless growth narrative may not have been incorrect. Although there is data from RBI and other places that, that suggests that jobs have been increasing. Now you can get into the data, it is two hours a week of job, etc. I don't want to get into that, but as a trend line, from 1984 till 2024, jobs have been increasing year after year, minus a few years in the middle. Last five years, they have, they have shot up, by the way, uh, uh, according to that data. And you can throw some other data at me and it will be as right or wrong. But the fact is that the government has uh, onboarded the political narrative of jobless growth into its budget and we can see. So it's a good sign that the democracy, the economic democracy is, a, is working. Uh, perhaps this jobs focus is a reaction to the 40 seats that uh, the BJP lost. Now, there is a lot of good schemes, many incentives. But to my mind, and uh, there is a lot of this question I'm going to ask you is a very loaded question. So maybe you need to expand it in your own way. Today, a job for an average Indian means a government job. There is no other job. And with all uh, you know, people, young people till the age of 30, 32, st sticking on, taking competitive exams, they're wasting their youth in pursuit of that one government job. So that's one side of the story. The second is the government job in a poor country like India to see the kind of benefits, the kind of protections, the kind of non-accountability, the kind of uh, monies, and until the NPS came, the kind of pensions that people have been getting, it is not surprising. That is the economic incentive uh, in the economy. If you want to create more jobs, which are not necessarily government jobs, I believe the government job has to be de-glamorized. It has to be stripped of all the other kind of benefits that make it a, uh, exceedingly unequal uh, place to be. Uh, so I don't blame the young people for doing what they are doing, but I'm not sure how far this private, uh, what, what Nirmala ji has done yesterday, uh, this incentives to private sector to create jobs will actually help transition the people into new jobs. You're raising a whole lot of issues. Jobless growth, Nice buzzword. But one should equally well have a different bu buzzword, which is growthless jobs. That does not happen. The only lasting solution to employment creation is growth. If an economy is growing at 7%, real, whether it's 7 or 6.5, let's not quibble about that. <clears throat> if an economy is growing at 7%, we either must accept that productivity is growing at 7% or we must accept that employment is growing. Will anyone... Not necessarily, any sir. That's a national income identity. I agree, but uh, there is a disruptor in the middle in the past decade called technology. That disruptor, uh, technology could have simply increased the productivity without... Uh, that will be reflected in the productivity calculation. Will anyone, even a votary of technology, agree that productivity in India has been growing at 7%? The answer is no. In fact, the RBI CLEMS database, 
that you mentioned also estimates productivity. But no one, technology or otherwise, will accept that productivity in India has been going at 7%, which means that there must be employment creation. Now, don't get me wrong. We may be creating 4 million jobs a year and we may need 8 million jobs a year as economic surveys stated. But to say that there has been zero employment growth is not a tenable proposition. Also do realize there is a legacy hangover here. The number of people in the 0 to 15 age group has declined in India since 2019, not the share, the number. Meaning India is already beginning a process of demographic transition where the population rate of growth is slowing down. Today it's probably about 0.8 percent, it's not 1.3 percent. In other, which is the reason why several schools are being closed down because there are no takers. We planned for a large number of people. The point I'm making is a very simple one don't want to belabor it. Often the mindset is the old planning commission figures that we need to create 12 million jobs a year. We don't. That's a legacy. We need to create 8 million. I'm granting that. We are not creating 8 million. I'm granting that also. So why aren't we creating 8 million? As a footnote to what I said, the issue is not just jobs but the kind of jobs that are being created. There are all kinds of problems with the labor market. One problem with the labor market, which the budget recognizes, which the economic survey also recognizes, is that there is a complete breakdown in the correlation between education and skills. A lot of people have invested within courts in higher education. Gross enrollment ratios in higher education have gone up. And some of this is not publicly funded, it's privately funded. Because I've invested in higher education, I expect a salary of 25,000 a month. I'm talking about the lower end of the bracket. But the market does not judge that I possess the skills to get 25,000 a month. The market is offering me 15,000 a month, which is why some people, those who can afford it in the lower age, lower age group, in the, in the uh, particular amongst the young, they are voluntarily dropping out of the labor market. Now, that's a serious cause for worry. But let's recognize that. Let's also recognize that the demand for jobs is in some places and the supply of jobs is elsewhere. Without naming states, there are some states where there's a clamor for government jobs, a few measly jobs in the railways, there's a mad clamor. But there are states where people complain about labor not being available. So we are also talking about inefficient intermediation of supply and demand because it's been through a system historically of contractors. Amongst the many transitions that India is going through, one of these is formalization, greater formalization. Formalization of individuals in the labor market and formalization of enterprises too. I harped on growth. But it's also true that the employment elasticity of growth in India has been going down. It's not a new phenomenon. It's not a Narendra Modi creation. This has been going on for at least 25 years. And the reasons for that, one of that is technology. Because manufacturing today is not as labor intensive as used to be the case earlier. It's much more technology intensive, capital intensive. The entry level jobs for relatively unskilled people is really construction, trade, hotels, restaurants. These things had suffered on account of COVID. 
there is evidence of that recovery, which RBI also points out that construction, trade, retail, these kinds of things. Government, yes, that mindset must go. This country's workforce, just one second, this country's workforce is something like 480 million. How many people work for government? 20 million, that's about it. Now, again, when you are reflecting the angst, which you are in a way, we think of the All India Services. But for God's sake, the 20 billion includes an ASHA worker who is also government. And how much is the ASHA worker paid a month? 1,000 rupees, 1,500 rupees. You raised uh, that perhaps he's not getting adequate money and hence is voluntarily dropping out. True. Therefore, can we conclude that the unemployment problem is really a wage problem? And if wages were to rise by X percent, say 25, 50 percent, uh, um, unemployment will uh, reduce? It's much more complicated, as is bound to be the case in a country as heterogeneous in India. 25,000 in a place like Delhi or in a place like Mumbai, think of a migrant worker. Think of what that migrant worker has to pay on lodging. Think of what that migrant worker has to pay on transportation. If you take these two things away, 25,000 in Delhi or Mumbai is not preferable to whatever I get sitting there in my home state. Think of all the government interventions which have improved the state of rural India. Whether it is through housing, whether it is through other things, whether it is through growth happening in states like Odisha, for example. So we have a very complicated employment issue. And I think one reason for that is... Countries in the West, they have gone through transitions, socio-economic transitions, growing at about 1%, 1.5% a year. When a country, China also did that, but China, the polity was completely different. When a country grows at 7% a year, it leads to enormous socio-economic churn. And reforms, you use the expression reforms. Reforms are about the market. The market means uncertainty. The market does not mean the security. I will go back and look and, and flag for you. Jet Airways. As long as the going was good, all the employees did not complain. But the moment... Jet Airways ran into a problem. All of them said the government should intervene. You can't have it both ways. Uncertainty means higher risk reflected in a risk premium in the salaries. Now, again, I'm not trivializing the problem. Yes, there are people who work for the government who are paid unnecessarily. But yes, at the same time, at least for union government, Group C, Group D has essentially been contracted out. It's contractual. What you see in Group C and Group D is really people who have not yet superannuated. Yes, there have been attempts to bring in lateral entry with variable degree of success. So that would be my reaction. You also mentioned one more point that uh, an educated person with a degree, etc. need not be a skilled person. I don't think that's the case anywhere in the world. Everywhere, uh, every student is asking, what am I studying this uh, demand supply ISLM curves for? Or what am I studying quantum physics for? And such and such theorem in mathematics and such and such history. And uh, when, when they join a company, they have to be trained. And there is a training 
schedule and for, for any company has every company has it and so i'm not certain whether or, or let me ask you is this peculiar to india that uh, the education system being in dissonance with the employability uh, system with companies demands i don't think it's peculiar to india what is peculiar to india is we spoke about expectations earlier expectations have been driven by liberalization you described yourself as a beneficiary of liberalization have been driven by liberalization and reforms however i choose to define liberalization reforms it's about competition the education sector higher education which is what we are really talking about higher education partly vocational education we are not really talking about school education now although there is a valid point that school education at the plus 2 level should provide a sufficient exit option but the limited point i am making is that higher education has still not been exposed to competition if you leave out professional education management engineering law education is still largely immune from competition and the benefits competition brings if i go to professional institutions there two students will complain why am i learning this why am i learning that so it's a question of a continuum but if i leave aside professional higher education there hasn't been the competition and so the gap between what a person with a qualified degree and the expectations of companies from such a degree continue to widen i don't know whether they continue to widen but it hasn't yet begun to happen there has been private entry which brings competition but not all private players in higher education have brought covered themselves with glory there have been several shady players so we i come back to the same point that in a country in a period of rapid transition goes through a churn and much of what we are witnessing is the pain because of the churn or the vested interests opposing the churn okay let me move to another contentious issue contentious <laughs> inequality unequal growth rich getting richer poor getting poorer the rising india story being limited to 1% or perhaps 0.1% of india and not trickling down and so on and so forth i was examining this closely and i firstly the kind of data that is being thrown at us uh, somehow doesn't um, i'm unable to respect it so uh, for me inequality means let us at an inter country level i i go to world bank data and there i see that gini coefficient has been falling it was 37 it is now 34.2 or 30 uh, 32 around about there in absolute terms in india and which is a good thing inequality is falling secondly when i take that number and context it against uh, let our equals let's say the top 5 economies or g20 economies india is very much in the middle we are at 30 fran uh, 32 france is at uh, slightly less than that uk is doing better germany is in the all of us are in the 30s you may change the decimal or maybe one or two percentage points america is at 42 and uh, the second metric that i see is the uh, income share of the top 10% of the population here too we are doing quite well so i don't understand where this inequality um, argument where is, what is the base of this inequality argument other than my anecdote is superior to your anecdote i don't think so <clears throat> but since you are on anecdotes let me relate an anecdote that's there in an essay that suresh tendulkar 
in some ways the doyen of poverty and inequality wrote in a book essays in honor of dr manmohan singh several years ago some two decades ago this anecdote concerns the time and i'm paraphrasing but the whole thing is within quotes when dr manmohan singh as deputy chairman of the planning commission so we are talking about the 80s went to visit china and they were briefed about china's economic and dr manmohan singh as deputy chairman of the planning commission remarked to the chinese minister but all of this will increase inequality and the chinese minister retorted we certainly hope so inequality well the question is inequality in what because after all whenever i use a metric that must be with respect to some there can be inequality in access there can be inequality in land markets this government has rightly since 2014 emphasized we must remove inequality in access that is not equitable so my i must ensure that every citizen anywhere in the country must have equal right of access to physical and social infrastructure financial products etc etc now that is the right definition of inclusion removal of inequality in access what you are talking about and the figures you are citing are about inequality in income and or consumption expenditure there is a separate kind of inequality which to my mind is more important and we don't don't talk about it which is inequality that is spatial and geographical in nature and let's understand what's happening here there are 600000 villages in india about 125000 of them were already integrated into the mainstream several people do not know that there are about 230 revenue villages in delhi are the villages in anything other than name no they aren't now the story of development in the last 15 years or so has been an increasing number of villages are now getting integrated into the mainstream think of a village which has a population size of 2000 and think of a village which has a population size of 200 if the village of 2000 population of 2000 is getting integrated it is increasing inequality between that village and the one that has 200 now is that a bad thing i don't think so and in fact empirical as well as theoretical evidence show that when economies tend to grow inequality thus defined tends to increase before it begins to dip which is why i related that anecdote about the chinese minister so far as the figures are concerned we do not collect data on inequality in the distribution of income full stop we collect data through national sample survey on inequality in the distribution of consumption expenditure until recently the last nss data was for 2011 12 and much of what was reported about india like in the world inequality report was on the basis of the 2011 12 national sample survey data and it was mechanically applied to india today we now of course have the nss consumption data world bank does not have any data on its own it is actually reporting the indian data and you are absolutely right the gini coefficient in india is not remarkably high it's dipped a bit the gini coefficient is an aggregate measure underlying the gini coefficient is a distribution of income what i think is happening is it's not that the bottom is not benefiting particularly in urban india not so much rural particularly in urban india the middle is getting squeezed and earlier we were talking about angst that angst is being expressed by that middle so
So it's not that the middle has not benefited in absolute terms because inequality is a relative term. Inequality is in comparison to Gautam. How Vivek stands in comparison to Gautam, it's always relative. So the angst is in the middle because you think, oh my God, look at that ostentatious display at a wedding. So people are getting rich. Uh, also, income is different from wealth. Uh, on wealth, there is no data. I, I, I haven't seen it, any. It it's be. just an opinion. It cannot be. And wealth, it's impossible to get data because how do you estimate? There are reports, but how do you estimate the value of stocks and shares and ownership? How do you estimate the value of real estate? But yes, there are. How do you areas. how do you estimate the value of a a, a road uh, adjoining which up till five kilometers inside? But so are, far, are farms. so far as the distribution is concerned, one last point I want to make, and this is a point that economic survey, not economic survey, essays that were brought out by Department of Economic Affairs made is that when you are comparing inequality across countries, as some people like Piketty and his colleagues tend to do, they are comparing post-tax in the West with pre-tax in India. Now, that's not fair. I admitted that post-tax in India will be very difficult to do, particularly because I said that I, we do not collect data on income. But let us also accept that one is comparing apples with oranges. Yeah, and Piketty's data uh, has been questioned by several other economists. That's correct. Uh, but that aside, for me, the philosophical point is, how do you measure wealth at all? Uh, it's easy to measure stock market wealth because it's listed, multiply your share by the market cap or number of shares and you have somebody's wealth. How do you, uh, which you also rightly raise, how do you, evaluate the value of land? How do you evaluate the value of a farm? Uh, how do you evaluate the value of a farm that has in, in its vicinity become a, 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 a wine grower, uh, uh, supporting wine, uh, grapes and, and so on? So I, I think the wealth is completely off. But in terms of just sheer whatever is uh, comparable, I find that India is doing very well. Not only that, the developed economies with very low genies, uh, today, when they had our per capita income, 2,500 to 3,000 range, their income in inequality was much higher. Uh, and, and I think people are forgetting this context when talking about inequality. I agree with you. We need to grow before we… Let me just add one thing. The Gini coefficient is an aggregate measure. And the Indian figure, as I said, is for distribution, consumption, expenditure. Distribution of income will be higher. So… Let's say for consumption expenditure, we are in the vicinity of 0 0.32. So for income, it would probably be 0 0.38 or thereabouts. Is that alarming? As a thumb rule, no. Because many countries have been through about 0 0.4. It becomes alarming. As in some countries in South America, when it shot up to about 0 0.6. Uh, South, Af South Africa today is extremely high. Brazil is extremely high. Argentina is extremely high. But I don't want to compare India with uh, like to like uh, is what I was doing. And I find India is doing quite well. I want to move now to uh, manufacturing. Firstly, is manufacturing in the new age of technology, in the age of robotics, in the age of drones, still likely to be the jobs creator of tomorrow? That's the first question. If so, uh, I don't think financial incentives alone are adequate for me as an economic agent to put my risk money into a factory. Today, uh, if I have a million dollars, I can make far more money simply passively by getting into an index fund. I'd, why do I need this? Uh, why, why should I take the trouble of creating uh, an enterprise, compliances, 
inspectors, corruption, labor, when uh, the, the system isn't supporting me. We are seen as the bad guys. We as in, not me, um, the, the entrepreneur. In fact, for the first time, please correct me if I'm wrong, for the first time, in, it is in this budget that uh, the finance minister uh, used the word entrepreneur in the context of a factor of production. I've been saying this for some time, that factors of production not, are not just land, labor and capital, but also the entrepreneur who puts it all together. It was very nice to hear this in her budget speech. Now, the, uh, when a system is anti-entrepreneur, when it's uh, coercive, when it is uh, rent-seeking, uh, and putting all kinds of burden on, on that, on the entrepreneur in manufacturing, ex more in manufacturing than in services, because there are more laws that apply to factories than to services. Then what is my incentive? Like I think I don't think a few percentage points here and there of margin is going to uh, provoke me into taking such a risk. <clears throat> Again. The trouble with Gautam's question is that they are de sound deceptively simple, but each of them has multiple layers in terms of answers. The etymology of the word manufacturing is hand, same root as manual. Eventually, India will grey. Eventually, India will age. Beyond 2035, India will age. But as of now, India still is a relatively young country with all the problems about skills, health, human resource development, etc., etc. So, India is still relatively young. And India, therefore, continues to have a relative comparative advantage in labor. India is not the U.S. AI, stuff like that, and economic survey discussed the threat to employment because of AI. AI, stuff like that, is technology intensive, capital intensive. The choice of capital, the choice of technology is dependent on the price of capital vis-a-vis -vis the price of labor. All I am saying is since India is going to continue to have for at least 20 years or 15 years a relative advantage in labor, I don't think we need to get paranoid about artificial intelligence. We need to get paranoid about natural intelligence or its lack. Having said that, Often people look at manufacturing as a share of GDP. And a figure that is often bandied around is 15% of GDP, which is roughly what manufacturing has. Manufacturing is not the same as industry. There are certain other components in industry, for example, mining. Industry as a share of GDP is roughly of the order of 25%. Agriculture is a little less than 15. Services is about 60%. These sectoral shares are misleading because sectoral shares depend on what is happening to other sectors. And roughly speaking, what's been happening in India is agriculture has been dropping by about 1% a year. Half of which has been picked up by manufacturing, half of which has been picked up by services, roughly, by industry, roughly. Yes, there are several problems associated with manufacturing. They have been documented for 20 odd years. Not just the procedures that you mentioned, but also interest costs. Also problems associated with labor laws and non-availability of skills. Manufacturing will not happen exactly in Delhi. Manufacturing will happen in the level of the states. And just for the record, depending on the year, the contribution of states to all India GDP is more than 95%. 
So what is happening to India in the aggregate is a summation of what is happening to GSDP, gross state domestic product of the individual states. So yes, I need the land. Yes, I need the labor. Yes, I need the environmental clearances. Yes, I need the physical infrastructure, the road, the water, etc., etc. And yes, manufacturing has a battery of problems that have been listed for about 20 years. Is it easing? Is the regulatory burden coming down? I think it is. Is it coming down sufficiently fast? Probably not. Is it coming down in every state? Probably not. And one of the chapters in the economic survey talked about the regulatory bill. I read that. But I think it, it overemphasizes it. I mean, for instance, the Jan Vishwas bill that, that was talked about, it reduces only by 114. Yeah. It decriminalizes yeah, only 114. All I'm saying is at least it emphasized the point. And she has mentioned G, uh, Jan Vishwas 2.0 yeah. in her budget. I, I think what we need to recognize is manufacturing will not uniformly happen throughout India. I think we need to recognize that largely because of transport connectivity. The nature of economic transformation is changing. Today, because of transport connectivity, what is happening is the north, the center, the west and the south, they are all getting integrated. Now, so far as manufacturing is concerned, I mentioned that the litany of woes has been documented for years and years. For years and years, we have been debating whether India is becoming part of the global supply chain or not. I think there is evidence in some sectors, the most visible of which is mobiles, there is evidence in some sectors that the phase manufacturing program, PLI, and the moving away from China has ensured that India is beginning to get into the global supply chain. Is it uniform for all sectors? Probably not, because the PLI has not been around for a sufficiently long time. But I think the discourse on manufacturing is in the process of change. You know, uh, let me uh, let me be skeptical about my own research. I was in Europe uh, last month, and uh, skeptical uh, about your own research, my, my or own your research shows that you're skeptical no, about what I said. I'm skeptical about my own research. So, my research talks about how compliances are so many: sixty-nine thousand two hundred and thirty-three compliance universe, twenty-six thousand one hundred and thirty-four. Uh, uh, provisions where uh, an entrepreneur can be jailed and so on. That is my research. My perception um, when I went there uh, and spoke to several people is that Europe is over-regulated. I don't think the regulatory framework of Europe is any different from that of India. In fact, they have gone a step ahead and they have regulated AI out of the continent itself. They have put the regulations in place before the industry has uh, been able to set up. Anyway, that aside, what I find is that from the small entrepreneur right till the top, uh, there, is a, there is an irritation, but there is also a deep compliance with all the regulations. In Europe. In Europe. In India, howsoever hard you do comply, there is an entity called corruption that comes and uh, sort of uh, distorts the, the objective of several regulations. I agree several regulations are wrong fundamentally. And that's what our research showed. But there, they also tend to distort uh, and put a burden on the entrepreneur. Uh, you have done enough work on corruption, uh, probably. 12, 13 years ago, I think you came, came out with a report with Lavish. Book. Uh, with, a, with a book on, uh, on corruption. And uh, somehow, right from 1940s, 1950s, we haven't been able to tackle corruption. So uh, I'm going to link it somewhat unfairly with this romance for the government job, getting the perks, the, the money, the security, the unaccountability with an excessive corruption that is there in the system. 
my sense as i'm engaging deeper with it is that even after jan vishwas 2 even uh, although i agree that several provisions once they are removed the scope for corruption will die that's my belief but my sense is this this virus of corruption that is embedded itself into every government department particularly the lower bureaucracy is unlikely to deliver the kind of results that uh, a simplification of a compliance universe will offer and therefore i'm the, here is the skepticism about my own research which is that suppose we were to reform compliances there will be greater manufacturing i'm not sure whether that causality will play out how do you see this well let me react on a side issue which is the jurisprudence in europe particularly on something like ai or new technology we savvy jurisprudence in the us some of these are unknown areas the relatively unknown areas the new areas our jurisprudence such as it is is somewhere in between the us and the eu we are not as stiffly regulatory as the eu but we are not as liberal as the us and there are there are reasons for that now let me come to the regulatory burden your research on the number was based on the old labor laws since then the labor laws have been unified into four codes having done that it is a fact that most states labor is in the concurrent list in the constitution having said that it is a fact that most states have not come out with orders or if they have come out with orders those orders have nullified the intended liberalization behind the codes it is also a fact that something like the shops and establishments act which cover services they completely state subjects and they continue to be fairly rigid it is therefore true that when one is talking about an enterprise an enterprise goes through three stages in its life entry functioning and exit particularly if you are talking about corruption some of it is entry and some of it is exit but the bulk of it is functioning stage when one is talking about corruption there is the big ticket corruption and there is the small ticket corruption the day to day interface kind of corruption which is the corruption you are hinting at when i deal with the government functionary the big ticket kind of corruption in my view is linked to the political process to the electoral process and electoral funding unless that is reformed the big ticket kind of corruption will not go away but we are talking about the small ticket kind of corruption the small ticket kind of corruption is due to a shortages or discretion wherever technology has removed the human interface and the discretion has gone corruption has actually declined cast your mind back to the corruption that used to exist with import licenses or foreign exchange i'm not saying it's become zero but it has come down think of the corruption that used to exist with the indirect tax system again i'm not saying it's become zero but it has certainly come down faceless assessment for example whenever the shortage has gone the corruption is gone at one point you had to bribe to get a gas cylinder at one point you had to bribe to get even a landline so when the shortage went that kind of corruption went so there where, is where are you headed with the, the shortage is me- meaning when you say that there will be a lot of manufacturing facilities is that uh, what no, shortage in the sense that those days you had to no no bri- I, i'm aware but how are you linking it to manufacturing and, and the corruption I'm, here I'm, I'm not, how how will that no, go no i was i was saying that because you said corruption some of it is linked to shortages Now, point, so point far there. as manufacturing yes. is now, so far as manufacturing is concerned, 
it's easy to blame the government. And we tend to think that the corruption is because this is rightfully mine, the government, the petty functionary will not grant me the license without the grease money being paid. All oil and all machinery requires grease, why not the government? This is the way it's caricatured in TV serials, films. But quite often, and the most visible example of that is in building regulations. I am bribing because I want to violate the law. Don't always presume that I am bribing because I want to follow the law. And you mentioned this in the context of the EU. I am bribing because I want to violate the law. Now, so far as this corruption is concerned, have you used technology? Have you used the interface? Have you used, have you used the opportunity to bring down the discretion to reduce bribe seeking of the kind that you are talking about of manufacturing? Not really. I think it depends a little bit on the state. There are states which have done so. The issue is not the number of regulations. The issue is the delays that those regulations cause. The issue is the time taken to get a certain approval. And without mentioning states, there are states which have fast-tracked the process for manufacturing, which is why, you know, which is why entrepreneurship has often gravitated towards those states. Those are also states which have historically been a bit more kindly disposed towards entrepreneurship, a point that you mentioned earlier. Okay. Um, let, we can go on talking about this forever, but uh, I want to talk about other things also. As a consequence of all that we have discussed so far and the reports that talk about the exodus of millionaires from India. Um, where are these millionaires going? They are going largely to Europe, America, Canada. Middle East as well. And West Asia. Yeah. In, within Middle East, I think more of Dubai and one, one or two geographies. Again, compliance is being easy. How can we not stop them? Because you, everybody is a free entity. And there could be reasons other than simply harassment. I mean, there could be clean air, for instance. But how can we uh, invite global capital, global entrepreneurs into our system? Um, let's say a reverse flight of millionaires and billionaires. I'm not talking about Apple. I'm not talking about chip makers, etc. Those will happen at their own pace, at their own time. But I'm talking about the smaller enterprise. India, you mentioned... 7% real, I would say 12% nominal growth economy. Super fast. It is growing so fast that we are unable to keep pace with it. By the time we build a, build a flyover, it is crowded. By the time an airport comes, it is blocked. It's blocked. I think we are going too fast. And why can't global entrepreneurs see these opportunities, make money from them, um, I'm turning the question around. I'm not talking about the flight of millionaires from India abroad, but the reverse uh, uh, coming into India to benefit from this growth. Mm. <clears throat> I know you don't want to talk about the flight, but I do want to remark on the flight. <clears throat> you can spend, as Gautam, 250,000 US dollars to acquire property overseas. You can club two years, so that's 500,000. You can club husband and wife, so that's a million US dollars. So you can afford as Gautam, one million US dollars to buy a house somewhere else without necessarily giving up citizenship. So a little bit of the flight, not in the citizenship sense, but in the sense of acquiring property overseas, is because of the liberalization and it's a desirable liberalization on the foreign exchange side. But le let me let me count, not counter, let me support that. That could also be for the extremely rich people, not like Gautam Chikarmane, 
but for the extremely rich people, uh, it could also be a diversification of asset allocation. So you have yeah. a property in India and say you think that maybe in Helsinki is a rising market. So let me buy a small apartment Possibly. in Helsinki or in London. Possibly. So it, it, it need not be anything to do with an exodus. Uh, that's yeah. a small point. Yeah. Uh, now on the other thing, we talk about net out migration, net migration from India. But it's also true that there is some limited degree of migration that happens into India. Perhaps not on the scale that we want, but it's happened. It's also true that there were a large number of expats in India pre-COVID. The reversal as a result of COVID, the reversal as a result of what happened due to COVID has not yet necessarily happened on that scale. So I don't think it's quite true that India has not been attracting entrepreneurship and human capital from overseas. Uh, it may be located in some parts, mm, IT hubs, etc., etc. Some of the manufacturing was concentrated in and around the national capital region. It may be concentrated in some countries. For example, Japan, South Korea, etc., etc. But I think my broad answer would be the simplistic one, which is the true one. That as India rises, as India begins to do well, then it will begin to attract talent from abroad also. And at least anecdotally, I know of several people from the US, anecdotally, who have chosen to relocate. Anecdotally, I will also point out to you that as far as professionals working in companies go, today you cannot rise to the top unless you have either a China or an India on your CV. It immediately leave, gives you a, a push. Like earlier it used to be Japan, South Korea, now it is China and India. I am talking about, and as India grows, we are, going to, we are not only going to be growing in terms of uh, output, but we will also be growing in terms of the number of global professionals who will come to India and work. I don't think India can grow only on the shoulders of Indians. No, it can't. We will be requiring ta global talent. The top companies today already have that talent. This talent will come down to uh, smaller, mid-sized, small-sized companies over a period of time. That is not what I'm talking. I'm talking about risk capital, entrepreneurs coming out here. And another anecdote which I'll give you, I was speaking to one uh, high commissioner of uh, uh, a Nordic state and she was saying that um, companies from their countries are finding it difficult to negotiate corruption. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm coming back to the previous point. And therefore, they don't know, they can't account for it. And they have laws over there in their home countries which uh, prevent them uh, from taking such risks. Uh, this is a very major issue. Corruption is no longer about you and me or a small entrepreneur here and there. Cor as, as India globalizes, as India becomes a 10 trillion economy, we will have to face this squarely. How do we end it? Um, in the process, we will end it for our, our, our countrymen as well. But I, do, I think it's a major hurdle for the rising India story. Mm, I wish there were a simple answer. But I want to emphasize this, that Following WTO principles, national treatment. We bring down something, we bring it down for everyone, not preferential treatment for foreigners. Now, I wish I could give you a simple answer, but my reaction would be that without contradicting the fact that there is corruption, sometimes it's used as a red herring, as a bogey. There are reasons why I don't want to come to India. There are reasons why I don't want to face the risk. And therefore, I use this red flag of corruption. Companies which want to come, which have done their calculations, that all right, you mentioned nominal rate of growth of 12%. What does it mean for average corporate profitability 18%? At least, where in the world am I going to get 18%? So I'd better enter India. Not a recent phenomenon, but for years and years.
companies which want to come have figured out ways of handling so called the corruption sometimes through joint ventures sometimes through indian partners in fact i would use this indicator of companies getting rid of jv partners indian jv partners as vindication of the proposition that the corruption is becoming less so i'm not dismissing the ambassador's argument i'm saying that let's not blow it out of all proportion and by the way corruption we have been using the word corruption i have not contested its use earlier corruption is with with reference to a certain definition in the laws and there are many things that happen in the united states which would be corruption as per indian standards of law particularly i am referring to the electoral process which are not corruption in the us so there is corruption and there is corruption okay so with this i am done with all my economics and unless you want to if in case i have missed something and you wish to add and now i am going to move to the last part of this conversation which is around uh, which is your second life uh, translating indian texts you began with the mahabharat i know you did the ramayana earlier you did the vedas but broadly your your seriousness about this i think began with the mahabharat and now you are on to the puranas i read the shiv puran i think it it has left the greatest impact on me uh, in terms of uh, my understanding of concepts how howsoever abstract it's a difficult puran to read it is so difficult that i haven't read the next one that you've published <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, i'm still sort of wallowing in it enjoying it uh, what brings you to this you didn't even know sanskrit and you learnt sanskrit in order to translate sanskrit texts what is this passion where is this coming from i will keep it simple because i can give you a very complicated answer keeping it simple i would hate to use the word i that i did this i did that i came to sanskrit i started doing the translations i am really an instrument it is destiny which is getting this done through me or a higher power which is getting it done through me i can give you which is why i don't want to delve into because it will take too much time i can give you examples of a series of coincidences accidents intervention by destiny which led me down this path please tell us we have all the time this is anecdotal so let me give the anecdote as you said i translated the mahabharat and then roughly at the same time i mean once the mahabharat was out of the way i was appointed a member of niti ayog in january 2015 so i told my wife that's it no more translations all right the hari vansha it's a sequel to the mahabharat i will translate the hari vansha after that i won't have time all right actually i translated the valmiki ramayan after the mahabharat oh Not i thought i thought that had come earlier no no no, no. after so i got the chronology wrong after that. So now I am a member of Niti Aayog. Translations are over and done with. They are not going to happen. I am sitting on a jet airways flight. Someone else was paying business class. Right next to me, there is a gentleman sitting there. I was reading something in Sanskrit. Ito Pradesh. If you want to know what I was reading. you had learned sanskrit by then oh yeah, yeah. For, for the mahabharat yes suddenly i noticed that the person next to me was reading something in sanskrit 
So that intrigued me. The probability of finding in these days one person on a flight who is reading something in Sanskrit is low. Finding two people who are on adjacent flights next to each other is beyond, beyond probabilities. So we introduced ourselves. This person was Shailendra Mehta, at that time professor in IIM Ahmedabad. And of course, we had known of each, uh, each other without meeting each other. So Shailendra said, Vivek, what next? I said, nothing. Uh, member of Niti Ayog, won't have the time. The Mahabharat, the critical edition on the basis of which I did the translation, for the Mahabharat, it was the Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute. For the Valmiki Ramayana, it was the Baroda Research Institute. These research institutes, Bhandarkar has improved now, but generally these research institutes are very bad at marketing. So for years and years, I had been chasing the Baroda Institute for their critical edition of the Valmiki Ramayana. Not free, I wanted to pay. But they would not reply. We don't have copies, so on and so forth. So I complained to Shailand. I am a member of Nityayog and for years I have been badgering the Baroda Institute for Valmiki Raman, can't get it. Okay, end of story. Two months pass. I got a phone call from Shailendra Mehta. Vivek, are you in office? I said, Yes, I am. He said, I'm coming. In walk Shailendra Mehta what with a trolley bag. In the trolley bag are volumes of the critical edition of the Valmiki Ramayana. He's begged, borrowed, stolen them from all over India. He said, all yours. I was in shock. I told my wife that after this, if I do not translate the Valmiki Ramayana, I'm ignoring what destiny is suggesting. Valmiki Ramayana out of the way. There is a, there are several Sanskrit universities in India. One of them is the Lal Bahadur Shastri um, Sanskrit Mahavidyalaya based here in Delhi. Many Sanskrit universities, the proceedings are in some other language. The teaching are in, is also in some other language. There are a few exceptions where everything is in Sanskrit, including the one in Tirupati, including the one in uh, Delhi. I would recommend a, a visit to the Tirupati one. It's quite an experience because the waiter speaks Sanskrit, the auto driver speaks Sanskrit, the s signage inside is in Sanskrit, etc., etc. Anyway. So the proceedings of the Lal Bahadur Shastri Sanskrit Mahavidyalaya are in Sanskrit, which by the way, the Lal Bahadur Shastri, there, there is an honorary doctorate in Sanskrit called Vachaspati. So I know of only two people who have got honorary doctorates, both in economics and Sanskrit. Uh, I am a Vachaspati technically, so technically I can call me, call myself Vivek Vachaspati, anyway. The other one is V. R. Panchmukhi. He used to be a noted uh, Sanskrit scholar. Anyway, so um, I get a phone call from Ramesh Pandey, the Vice Chancellor, then Vice Chancellor of Lal Bahadur Shastri, saying that we have a convocation and all our proceedings are in Sanskrit. We want you to be the special guest. The chief guest at that time was a then HRD minister, Smriti Irani, who had been given a written text in Sanskrit, which she proceeded to read out very competently. That's how I met Ramesh Pandey. Ramesh Pandey said later, not on the day of the convocation, I got to know him that way. What are you up to now? I said nothing. For the Puranas, by the way, there is no critical edition. The most authentic edition of the Puranas is believed to be something called the Ninnai Sagar edition, which was republished and reprinted with a grant from the Ministry of Human Resource Development in the 1950s, starting in the 1950s, by a publisher in Delhi called Nag Publishers. 
when I say Puranas, do realize that some of the Puranas are very large. So, um, the text can span multiple volumes and they are like putis. The text themselves, as they are printed, they are like putis, uh, if you have seen a puti. Anyway, so Ramesh Pandey said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I have been thinking of the Puranas. There is no critical edition. I have been thinking of Nag publishers. I have not been bothered to go and find out. Okay. There are 18 Mahapuranas and I said many Puranas have multiple volumes. He has collected the Purana texts for 11 Mahapuranas. He said, Le Came back. I thought since I have collected the 11, if I have got the 11, no. Why not the remaining seven? So I rang up Nag Publishers. He came to see me. I said, look, all publishers retain one copy in your records. So can you give me the other seven? He said, yes, but the family has divided up its business and it belongs to my brother, that the, the Purana. I will see what I can do. About a month later, he turns up with the other seven. He has photocopied the whole lot. I said, how much? He said, nothing. You are doing a major work. This is my humble contribution. I can go on and on, but these are examples of what I mean by interventions of destiny. Why this is important to me in particular is irrelevant. But I think the work that you are doing on this side in translations is important for a rising India. And uh, I don't think India can rise without understanding its cultural moorings, its spiritual legacies. And that is more uh, an abstraction. But in several uh, texts, for instance, in Arthashastra or even in the Mahabharata, uh, in the Rajadharma uh, Parva, there are some things that we can learn or at least reflect on. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying we copy-paste the past onto a present and build a future based on that. I think there is dynamism and we are perfectly capable of handling it. For instance, uh, one-sixth of the produce will be taxed. You mentioned we have a tax GDP ratio roughly the same. Of rough, which is roughly the same. Uh, I don't know, do we want a tax GDP ratio of 40%? going forward as a developed nation, when we become a Vikasit Bharat uh, and we stand in the committee of what are known as developed nations, we are looking at 30, if we, if we follow, 30 to 40. Uh, if we follow your Nordic ambassador's recommendation, yes. No, I am just saying that uh, here, uh, so one is the number itself, but behind the number is also the role of the state. And I think India in the past has been a small, tight, strong state. Do we want to change that and become a 40%, 30% state uh, uh, where uh, individual freedoms, individual flexibilities, individual expressions are all concomital or dependent on or led by uh, the state? I, I, I disagree, but I just want to know how, how you context these numbers with the, glo with the global numbers and Vikasit Bharat. Let me simplify and do a little bit of stereotyping. There are two polar models in the world, one of capitalism, one of socialism. The ideal capitalist state does not exist anywhere in the world. The ideal socialist state does not exist anywhere in the world. But I am using this for purposes of stylistic in the ideal capitalist state, all decisions are left to the market, they are left to individuals. All allocation decisions are taken by individuals by the market. In the ideal socialist state, all allocative decisions are taken by the state as in the government. No centrally planned economy ever approximated it, but at least that was the ideal. So, these are the two polar opposites. 
we had a third, which we have forgotten about, we don't talk about, which is there in all of our texts. That one is some decisions are by the individual oblique household, some decisions are by the state, but the rest are by the community. If I go back 100 years, no, a little bit more, 110 years, you'll find all the water bodies were looked after by the community. My favorite example is a district gazettea from uh, Rotak, 1883. When a canal is being built, in 1883 rupees, that canal cost 45,000 rupees. The government of the day paid 20,000. Who paid the remaining 25,000? The community did. Without corporate social responsibility, without anything like that, without the danda. In 1886, the citizens of Venaras came together to clean up the Ganga. This community involvement we have forgotten about. This community involvement is part of our texts. It is part of Easter. It is part of Purta. That is what we need to resurrect. I corrected myself because there was a Government of India Act in 1919. And to my mind, our belief that I will do nothing, the government will do everything, is Government of India Act 1919, Government of India Act 1935, and what happened post-1945. You think we can transition to that model? Provided we first know that that model existed. Is I'm, there a, is there a well-defined, are there legs to that body? Has this model been, I mean, in stories it's different, in preaching it's different, but is there a ready model or at least tenets of those models available? No, no, what available? you mean is, is there a ready book? Like Kautilya's Arthashastra. I'm just saying ideas. It need not be a book. Just some ideas that put together see, the community. You see, there, there's, there's, the National Manuscript Mission is a mission to document and collate manuscripts that exist in India. And the estimate of the National Manuscript Mission is that there are 40 million manuscripts floating around in, in, in India. Many more outside. Not many more. Some outside also. A manuscript being defined as anything that's more than 75 years old. National Manuscript Mission's estimate is that 95% of these have not been translated. I have a text, 13th century, copy of a text called Chodya Shastra. As the name implies, it's a manual for thieves. If I were to translate it, it would run into 450 pages. It is unimaginable the kind of things we had texts on, not just in Sanskrit, in Pali too, many other languages. So until we translate, we do not know what is there. I am sick and tired of Arthashastra, although you mentioned it, because we think of governance, we think of Arthashastra. There were at least 11 other texts that were like Arthashastra. No one talks about them because there was no one like Shama Shastri who came along and translated them. So yes, we need that translation to happen. Has anyone even hinted at what I am suggesting the community? I think uh, Dindal Upadhyay in his April 1965 speeches, you will find traces of it in Swami Vivekananda here and there. But I completely agree that one needs something particular in English, someone explaining that this is the this is the template that exists. Gautam can do it. Uh, I, I love your confidence, but for that I'll need to learn Sanskrit first. <laughs> but uh, these temple economies that are there all across India, they would have been subdivisions of a, such a community uh, surge. Mm -hmm. And each, also, each temple economy would be unique. Uh, oh, also, I, I, I completely agree because so temples… Maybe there may not even be a single text, but <clears throat> what we are looking for is the underlying principles. 
I agree. Uh, of a I com- agree. Of but I'm just saying that I mentioned a text because no one has laid out those principles very clearly. I mean, they exist in the Sanskrit text, but no one has articulated them very clearly. The temple economies that they, you see, they were hubs of delivery of health services. They delivered education services, finance, uh, finance, and in fact, um, also urban development in a way. You can see that happening in some places. Uh, I, I mentioned Tirupati earlier. One example of that is that some of the newer ones like Iskon, etc., etc. These are almost green field. So yes, I agree with you. For brownfield places, particularly for a place like Varanasi, it's very difficult to imagine what you're saying. But ideally, yes. Yeah, because I I also believe, and as Sri Aurobindo also has said, though not in this context, that. Um, Every nation has to rise on its own. Uh, Agreed. Uh, uh, with its own spirit. Agreed. Today we are rising, no doubt. We have been late, no doubt. But we are rising towards something which is alien to what is intrinsic to Bharat. And uh, we may become a developed nation, maybe the equivalent of a Portugal in terms of per capita income by 2047. But Uh, i don't know if in the process we are going to lose this entire knowledge system our moorings and with each generation we are going further and further away and the, and the cartage of this culture I, I, it's, it's getting limited smaller and smaller and that's what it doesn't worry me but it it does concern me that i think it, the rise of india should be led by india and not by like economically we began to ape uh, soviet union soon after independence then we began to ape europe then we began to ape japan and uh, now usa i think we got to find bangladesh our own bangladesh in between uh, uh, pardon bangladesh in between gramin bank <laughs> <laughs> yeah but those are uh, tiny thing but as as we have never been comfortable with who we are and uh, i think the work that you are doing at least puts it out there that this is who we are and from there to build this uh, this community model that you are talking about is worth researching I, i don't know if there is any any scholar even thinking about these issues uh, and and i'm not saying in abstraction in terms of a, a a cultural jingoism i'm talking in terms of the rise of india uh being led by indians through indian thoughts i think that confidence we are still lagging i don't know when this will come maybe at vikasit bharat we can st- restart the journey i don't know we need to be wealthy before we can uh, uh, explore these risky options uh, of a, a community led development but if you were to craft a, a state craft on the on such principles tell us two or three things that you would do to encourage community building um you said you are concerned not worried i am actually worried because uh, i don't think i'm being provocative i think the younger generation has completely lost its moorings with the past for several reasons part of this is the collapse of the joint family system uh, early i learned things from grandfathers grandmothers i no longer do so in terms of an identity whether i accept it or not i'm completely lost as a cliched thing not cliched since you mentioned vikasit bharat i often ask the young not in my office others that is it vikasit bharat or is it vikashit bharat because the two words mean completely different things my question makes no sense to them i'm sorry to say your question makes no sense to me i don't know the difference between vikasit and vikashit no, but you understand that there is a difference in the pronunciation yes, you understand yes. that understand there the is a pronunciation but i don't understand you the you understand the that there is a difference in the letters it. vikasit is something that is shining and i'm sure the government does not want to use the slogan india shining 
vikashit is something that is blooming so that is relevant for a developed india but the point i was making the question made no sense makes no sense to any young person i ask 50 years ago it would probably have made sense <clears throat> could your sample size be uh, distorted because you are living in the cities and talking to super hyper educated people and once you go in the interiors you may face a different answer in all probability yes in all probability yes now principles three principles this is sounding like uh, um, dharma uh, dharma is not just religion it means a way of life also this is sounding like please give me dharma for dummies mm. in one two no, three. I, i understand i understand yeah <laughs> so take 5 take 10 i mean, a, I mean it's it's broadly bit, just elaborate it's a, it's a little bit difficult to do but you see at the root of it all is uh, grihasthas householders created wealth sanyasis and those in vanaprastha or brahmacharis did not create wealth so there was explicit recognition without using this word that brahmanas that <coughs> sanyasis and those in vanaprastha and brahmacharis they were predators in the sense that they predated on the wealth created by grihasthas many of whom were vaishyas who were in the business of today what we would call entrepreneurship note that most of the funders for the buddha were actually vaishyas so in in the i don't want to get into a huge debate here on the varna vyavastha but essentially it involved an equilibrium between brahmanas kshatriyas vaishyas and shudras the brahmanas and the kshatriyas they were also predators the vaishyas created the wealth and whenever there was a disequilibrium the vaishyas revolted which is why they funded the buddha but anyway that's beside the point so there is a recognition <coughs> that dharma is not only about the other world the caricature of hinduism the caricature of hinduism that hinduism is only about the other world is, is incorrect not correct at all hinduism is also about this world hinduism is also about earth but one of the principles is there must be equilibrium between dharma earth and kama. kama moksha is a different thing that's the other world dharma earth and kama as a, as a as a trivial example of that in the mahabharata it says that the king must spend 8 hours and dharma must spend 8 hours on artha and 8 hours on kama but anyway the point is equilibrium between them and one could say that in terms of those extremes of capitalism or socialism that i talked about you did not have that equilibrium the next principle is how do i interpret dharma dharma is not just about moksha dharma and the other world dharma is also about dana dharma dharma is also about the fact that i eat after the atithi has eaten atithi is not a guest a guest is someone about to the rival i know if gautam invites me for dinner i am not atithi atithi is a tithi someone who turns up unannounced so i eat only after the atithi has eaten as a householder there are five yagyas i must do every day which is partly studying and etc etc but it's partly also feeding humans feeding animals every day every day and even today you will find people lay out food for uh, um, for animals not so in metros not so in urban india where it is dying out it exists in the rural areas i have traveled in the course of my work to rural india if i happen to go at a time that's a meal time invariably i will be told have your food and go that is part of the sanskriti 
it's not part of the sanskriti necessarily elsewhere in yeah, the that's world that's where the community ideas yes. are reflected uh, through the individual through the individual but it doesn't necessarily exist today if, if gautam and invites me for dinner we will wonder what shall we take as a gift no in our sanskriti the guest is the one who's honoring the host so it's the guest who's given a gift so there are all kinds of components to this dharma system um ujjain district gazette here i mentioned district gazette is earlier let's think of it in terms of the gram panchayats and the higher level panchayats the bull was maintained by the entire village the cow belonged to you and me but the bull was maintained by the entire village the village took its turns to uh, take care of the bull but at the right time the bull is going to impregnate the cows if the bull impregnates only the cows in the village that will lead to inbreeding so how will the bull be rotated across villages the district level panchayat used to do it do we remember this we don't do we even know this existed no so in some sense the word gotra is rooted in the same etymology of go now all of these things we have simply forgotten about read the read the police reform report of 1901 and 1902 the village constable was maintained by the village not by the government so you are absolutely right we had a small government compensated by a large community and individual involvement in governance some ways uh, in some ways india is crafting its own governance and uh, regulatory systems for instance uh, dpi we are given your given your context and the way you articulated the question we are crafting meaning we are stumbling along because we have lost but perhaps sanskriti. that intrinsic uniqueness does exist for instance this uh, digital public infrastructure probably is closer to the old models than the european or the uh, uh, yeah. american or the chinese model there are three dominant I, I, models I, I, today I, i agree but the, but what we are discussing right now is that there was this model which we have generally forgotten about so dpi wouldn't fit into this community no i guess in a broad sense it would in a broad sense because we cannot go back we have we can only no, no, take no, no. principles and then no, no, move no, no, forward no one is saying go back because you need to adapt you need to move forward yeah. but all one is saying is there were lessons in that model which we have forgotten about we don't even have the model as, as you are saying you, perhaps that's your next book <laughs> well let me let 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 me give an example that you will relate to the british did not understand the indian music system where is this you don't have scores and indeed if i go to a performance by gautam chikramani today and gautam sings the same raga tomorrow it will be different because it's an interactive thing the british did not un- uh, understand it so they ruined indian painting for a long time and sculpture because they imposed western notions the music system they did not understand so they could not ruin it and even today music exists everywhere it thrives and dance what's your uh, we'll conclude now i just want to know uh, what's the next book you are now working on which purana is it well there are two puranas i have completed which are awaiting publication with penguin uh one is kurma puran one is matsya puran i thought matsya is out uh, no 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 brahmanda puran is out uh, kurma and matsya are waiting with uh, awaiting publication with penguin i've just started translation of the garur purana in between um, 
I got blackmailed into a digression because with Amit Kapoor, I have done a book on the Jyotirlingas, which have, which is about to come out next month. And uh, Penguin, like many publishers, has a policy of not publishing books by the same author in quick succession. So, because the Jyotirlinga book is coming out in August, uh, Kurma Puran has now been publication has now been pushed to 2025. So, uh, those are the ones that are coming out. What are you working on? Uh, uh, I've just started on Garud. Garud Puran. Garud is a smaller Purana, right? Um, no, because it will be two volumes again. Uh, two volumes. I am guessing it's about 380,000 words, but not one volume, two volumes. How are you able to do two intense works together? One it, is… The, you the, you the, block the, out everything else, which is uh, easier said than done. Uh, if someone… So, uh, whenever I am doing the translation, I block everything out. I think the expression multitasking is a misstatement. There is no multitasking. Uh, a person may seem to be multitasking, but at any single point of time, he or she is just doing one thing. The trick is to block out everything else. So, concentration, the ability to concentrate. Yeah, maybe, yes. Um, it's, it's, it's something that has happened to me over time. If you were to ask me for lessons one, two, three on how do I achieve it, I have no idea. No, I won't ask. <laughs> <laughs> it's not possible. But thank you very much, Dr. Thank Debroy. You. It's been uh, very enriching. Thank you, you and Namaste. Namaskar.